Sonny gave the Cardinals a chance, but the Bats left them without one against Clayton Kershaw. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shape Daily. Brendan Schaefer with you Sunday evening, August 18th, 2024. The Cardinals play a three-game series against the Dodgers this weekend. They play pretty well in all three games, all things considered, but they end up losing the series two out of three. And the rubber game on Sunday, the reason for the loss, it was quite simply the offense, not producing against Dodgers starter Clayton Kershaw. Dodgers win this one 2-1. to one. They take the series 2-1 to one as well. As on Sunday, Sonny Gray had the chance to be the hero for the Cardinals. Didn't quite pitch well enough to do that, but he did give the Cardinals a chance. Five innings, two runs allowed, a solo home run against you-know-who, Shohei Otani, leaves St. Louis with two for the weekend. I think he went two for 13 in the series, but both of his hits were home runs, and this one ends up being the difference in the game as his solo shot was matched by Lars Nupar, who had a pinch hit home run in the eighth inning, but the Cardinals didn't score the rest of the game, and they lose to the Dodgers 2-1, to one, and they drop the series after the tough loss on Friday night, followed by a solid win on Saturday, but one out of three is not getting anywhere for the Cardinals. You are going to be stuck in the muck and the mud and the goo and the crud. It's not where you want to be. 61-63. and 63. That'll be the Cardinals' record as they begin a new week. They get the off day on Monday, regrouping before welcoming the Milwaukee Brewers to town. The Brewers are so far ahead in the standings that it honestly feels ridiculous to keep talking about them. So I won't even tell you the number. You can Google it. But it's more, it's a higher number than is worth mentioning, frankly. So that's where the Cardinals are right now. We'll talk about the struggles for the offense. We'll give you our thoughts on Sonny Gray's day. Also, we want to play a little audio of John Mozeliak. He joined Tom Ackerman on KMOX for sports on a Sunday morning today and gave a quote that we need to hear related to the Jordan Walker platoon situation. We'll also tell you about the former Cardinal who produced a walk-off hit for his new team, and we'll go down on the farm and tell you about the Cardinal prospect that homered again today for his 17th home run of the season. It's all coming up on the show, and if you like daily St. Louis Cardinals videos and podcasts, click subscribe to this channel, Brendan Schaefer, St. Louis Cardinals writer, that's what we do here. All season and the offseason, too, we will be here. And that's rain or shine. Regardless of whether the Cardinals are performing well, that's kind of still what we're going to be doing on the channel. And right now it's been a lot of rain, and the downpour continues this weekend. Play pretty well, as I said. I, I don't think the Cardinals embarrass themselves against one of the best teams in baseball, but based on the bed that they've made at this point in the season, soft, cushy, couple games below five hundred. Simply not embarrassing yourselves is not enough. It's not, it, there's no moral victory. There's no, you can build on this. Like, there's no time to build. You just have to win. And a two out of three series win would have been enough to at least kind of start the ball rolling back toward, you know, potentially finding their way maybe into this playoff race. Right now, they're not even in the race. I don't re really think you can classify them as being in this race right now. Five games back in the wild card of the third spot that's occupied currently by the Atlanta Braves. The Mets are two back of Atlanta. The Giants are four back of the Braves. And the Cardinals are just barely ahead of the Cubs and Reds right now by a half game and a full game apiece. And the Reds, I had mentioned, have recently lost 10 in a row, and they're still only two and a half behind St. Louis. The Cardinals aren't part of this until they find a way to wrap off four, five, six in a row at some point. And that's really all the option that they're leaving themselves. And there's no spite in it. I'll continue to say it's not like we're being hateful to talk about the Cardinals for what they are. They are a mediocre team through 124 games this season. And with each passing game that you don't win, the job of proving that you're anything other than a mediocre team becomes all the more difficult. The record will decide what you are. There's You can tell us what you are. You have to show us what you are because that's what counts. And right now the Cardinals are continuing to show us that they're a, an inconsistent team offensively. They had a nice go of things against the lefty Robleski on Friday. They followed it up with a solid outing against Bobby Miller on Saturday. Now, I get it. A lot of teams have made Clayton Kershaw look silly over the years, but the Cardinals were rather non-competitive today. Six total hits in the game against the Dodgers. They also drew a walk that went to Contreras. The top three in the batting order win Contreras and Pham. Uh, no hits for that group, and even when Burleson came in, as a late sub for Fam, he went over as well. So the top of the order was not much for setting the tone in this game. Your hits come from Arenado, Goldschmidt, Donovan, Pajes, and the homer by Newbar. One hit apiece for each of those gentlemen. And then Victor Scott rounding it out at the bottom of the order had a base knock as well. It was an, an inning where Pajes and Scott led things off with base hits consecutively. Try to think that maybe they can find their footing a little bit in that one. Nope. 
That was the inning that ended with a Wilson Contreras double play. You had Arenado ground into a double play to end the game. Cardinals grounded into three double plays on the day. It's just been that kind of go for it. The Cardinals can have two games offensively where they do a solid job. They only win one of them, and then third game of the series, not a good day offensively, and that's how you lose two of three. I get it. It's the Dodgers. A lot of teams are going to lose to the Dodgers this year. The Cardinals didn't have the luxury this weekend to lose the series. They they can't continue going backward. There's just not enough time. So as a result of that, they are where they are. Sonny Gray, what do we think of his outing today? He was fine. The command was really strange for him in the first few innings. Was able to to get out of a bases loaded jam. Obviously, the high early pitch count and the number of stressful pitches he had to throw, I think, kind of took him out of this game a little earlier than you would hope. You want to see a guy that's you know supposed to be your ace get you through six innings. He got him through five on 94 pitches, only 56 strikes. I didn't have an issue with taking him out at that point. The Cardinals were down in the game anyway. Uh, seven hits allowed, two runs, both earned. Three walks from Gray. Again, the times where he's not in as much of command of his pitches, you, you sometimes see the walks come against him. And in this game, was able to limit the damage for the 10 base runners that he allowed to only have two of those runs score. He kept the Cardinals in the game. like He gave them a chance. But that's the type of maybe way we'd like to speak about the number three or the number four or the number five starter. Like, well, he gave him a chance to win. If you get that from your number five, you're you're doing backflips about it, and you're just saying, look, the offense should have done more. Um, when it's Sonny Gray and you, you've got Clayton Kershaw on the other side, I think you would have wanted to see a little bit of an extra gear from him today. Instead of giving that extra gear, he simply did not hurt the Cardinals, but it is what it is. The offense didn't end up doing its job. Anyway, the, the pitch to Shohei Otani was a bad one. Middle, 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 middle. There was nothing else for him to do with that but to homer on it. But that happens from time to time. But I'm going to put more of this, obviously, on the offense. Newt Bar, good to see him have that swing. And Ollie Marmel talking after the game about how he has been feeling better by better, bit by bit, when it comes to his swing and where he's at at the plate. And that was a spot where they pinch hit Newt Bar for Pedro Pajes, knowing that they'll essentially be burning the DH. But as Ollie framed it after the game, that was their last shot to maybe get anything going. And so they brought the lefty new bar in against a right-hander. Walker did get to take the at-bat in that inning against, I believe it was Daniel Hudson of the Dodgers. So when we talk about the platoon stuff as it pertains to Jordan Walker, that was Ollie at least giving him a shot against a righty, even though you know we've seen them activate the platoons and we've seen them use different lineups, and that was a topic that came up after the game as well. For instance, you, you have Burleson not starting the game, but he comes in for... Tommy Pham and takes multiple at bats in this game just to try and maximize any edge the Cardinals could find. I mean, that is absolutely the way that they are are playing these games and are coaching and managing these games. And the the edge wasn't enough today because the offense just did not produce. But uh, those are the types of things that are happening. So yeah, they'll burn the DH when they figure it's a last gasp effort. And it worked out in so much as Newpar was able to hit the home run, but Walker unable to get on base ahead of him. Walker was 0 for 3 in this game, by the way. And it just, it is what it is right now for the Cardinals. And I'm not going to rip too hard on Walker. I, I don't think he's looked great. And by the way, if I don't sound great, it's because the the little illness that I felt like was popping up when I did the show last night, it was indeed here for me. Had a temperature and a fever throughout the day today. And my son does too, but I think he's, he's going to turn things around and so am I. But hey, that's just in, in case I'm a little gravelly and uh, you can hear the fact that I've got the hot tea swirling next to me. That's why. But anyway... I'm not going to ride Jordan Walker too hard for the struggles we're seeing right now because I genuinely believe the way the Cardinals are using him is, and this is a sad statement, but it's the best case scenario that they can provide in terms of having him be an extra right-handed bat when they play against lefties. But it's not the best thing for not only his development, which is obvious because he's got to be playing every day. I've said that from a development standpoint for Walker, the only thing that they can't do is the thing that they're doing, which is to platoon him. He either needs to be playing every day in Memphis or every day here. There cannot be any in-between. Organizationally speaking, they're doing it wrong, period, the end. There's no discussion about this. But we also talked at length about how because of how poorly John Mozeliak has constructed not only the 40-man roster, the 26-man roster, and then on down to the minor league depth that they don't have a right-handed hitting outfielder that can be the role, this very niche role on the roster that Jordan Walker is occupying, it's interesting that that's honestly the best, they view it this way anyway, that he's the best case scenario for that role. But not only from a development standpoint, just from a having him succeed for his 
Like, if you were going to say, we're going to do everything possible to get Jordan Walker the best batting average or the best OPS that we can at the big league level, you'd almost do the opposite. You'd play him against righties and not lefties because he has reverse splits throughout his career. So they have him taking these at-bats against lefties only when even though his splits are not crazy, they they do favor his ability to produce against righties compared to lefties, but that's not what the need of the team and of the organization at large is, and that's how Jordan Walker has landed in this situation where the role that he is in, the Cardinals view on a on a day-to-day level as being the, the way that he can help the team best because of what they don't have against left-handed pitching versus what would maybe be best for his development is not necessarily what's taking place. And development-wise, you would honestly have him batting against righties and lefties regardless of his splits. His splits aren't that egregious in either direction. They do favor his production against righties by a little bit, but you would just have him batting against both because you're 22 years old and, and this is a guy who's a former top prospect and you want to see him getting every opportunity to be able to improve those skills, whether that's at the big league or the minor league level. But that is going almost in direct contrast to what the Cardinals need right now because they don't have enough guys that are effective against left-handed pitching. And he is the best option that the Cardinals have at their disposal in their entire organization to fill this role. And I had said off the top I was going to talk about John Lozalock's quotes to Tom Ackerman from Sports on a Sunday Morning. I would actually rather start with what Ollie Marmol told him about the very same topic. And we will compare the two answers because I thought Ollie Marmol's answer was insightful and explains kind of some of the stuff that we've been circling the drain on anyway. But you're going to get it directly from the horse's mouth, which is so valuable because you can understand exactly what Ollie Marmol and the Cardinals are thinking about this situation. So let's start with that, but that won't be the end of the conversation because I don't know that John Mozalock's answer was exactly in line, but I thought Marmol's was very insightful. Here's this from Ollie Marmol. This was sports on a Sunday morning this morning, uh, Sunday morning on KMOX with Tom Ackerman. I appreciate the answer. And I know you've been asked this question about a hundred times, but bear with me. Uh, Jordan Walker. So, you know, Jordan comes up, he, he was your number one prospect. He, he, he comes up and, and plays last year, plays at a high level, plays all the time. Um, I don't know what my expectation was. I, mine, I guess, was that he's hitting consistently in Memphis. He's going to come up and, and join this team. I wasn't sure how much playing time he would get. You Basically, the call-up was not just to give Jordan the time, but to it was out of need. Ollie, you wanted him to be up because you lacked more batters who could face left-handed pitching? Yeah, let, let's talk through that. Uh, I don't have an issue talking through that one because I've gotten the question quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And there's some assumptions of if you call the kid up, you play him every day compared to um, the situation that we're currently in. So so Carp goes down with an injury. Um, he was going to be unavailable for that series in, in Cincy. So therefore, it's, it's hard to just play a man short. So we make the move. And, and what you're thinking through here is this. Um, and, and a couple things come to mind. You need someone that could play the outfield if you're going to make that move because our biggest issue has been production against left-handed um, pitching. So being able to pick a spot for either a Donovan, a Burleson, or a Newt to be on the bench and come off the bench and play somebody against a left-hander is preferably be somebody that could kind of roam the outfield um, because Pajes is catching and Contreras is going to take the DH spot against left-handed pitching. Um, So that eliminated at the time some of the other options. And when you look at Walker, one of the questions that was brought up is, all right, he's a reverse split guy. Well, one, it's not an extreme reverse split guy, but I understand the argument. Um, The the better question is, isn't that he hits right-handers better than he hits left-handers as much as does he hit left-handers better than our left-handers hit left-handers? And the answer to that is 100% yes. Um, and then the next question you need to ask yourself is, does he hit right-handers better than our left-handers hit right-handers? And uh, Burleson's done a nice job. Donnie's done a nice job. Newt's in a little bit of a funk, and, and, and he's working on getting back on track. But our need was for someone to come in and help against left-handed pitching. Um, that is what he came up here to do based on an injury. So that is his role at the moment, and uh, we'll continue to, to monitor where we're at. 
So that's a long answer from Cardinals manager Ali Marmel with Tom Ackerman this morning, but an insightful one. Like, I think even the most ardent Ali Marmel haters should be able to hear that and understand exactly what he's saying. It, you might not like it relative to what you believe Jordan Walker's development path should be, and if you don't like it, that's that's fair game for criticism. But Ollie Marmel didn't call the guy up, right? Like, I, we would like to think that they were in conjunction with it, with that decision. But when you think about Ollie Marmel saying 100% Jordan Walker's best against left-handed pitching is better than our lefty's best against left-handed pitching, so he's going to play for one of those guys. By the way, though, the name that he didn't say was Nola Gorman. Like, Gorman is almost an afterthought for Ollie Marmel at this point. I don't know how I can differently describe it. With And again, maybe because... Maybe the reason for that is because he was strictly talking about the outfielders, but we all know that Brendan Donovan is more than capable of moving to second base, staying in the lineup, and then you can plug in a righty bat for Gorman. But when we're talking about it against lefties, Gorman is not even on the radar considered as somebody that would be that would be given those shots, right? It's those other lefties that he named, Donovan, Newt Barr, and Burleson. One of those guys is going to have to sit to accommodate Jordan Walker when they face a lefty. Gorman's already sitting is sort of the is sort of the real truth of that matter. Right? And, and Donovan isn't the one that needs to be sitting. It's Gorman. So really it boils down to you're going to have to sit Newt Bar or you're going to have to sit Burleson to get Jordan Walker in the lineup. And we can use today's lineup as a great example of that because Donovan played second and both Newt Bar and Burleson were off the bench. Both of them come into the game for righties later on after the lefty Kershaw exits the game. But that's really what it's looking like, and that's how Jordan Walker finds his way into the lineup against lefties. It's about what Walker can do relative to what the other guys can do, more so than it's about what Walker can do versus left relative to what he can do versus right. But then the the quote about the next question you have to ask is, is Walker's best against right-handed pitching better than their lefties? and the guys they already have on the roster against right-handed pitching. And that was where Ollie kind of hem-hawed a little bit and said, well, Burley does a nice job. Uh, Donovan does a nice job. Newt Bar was the name that you circle and you you highlight and you put it in bold. He obviously homered today, so him turning the corner could be a huge development for the Cardinals. But there was a period where there was a case to be made that Walker should be starting above Newt Bar if because Newt Bar's not overly splitty. It shouldn't matter to him left-right. He just was was struggling overall. But all he is going to know better than any of us on the outside are going to know how Newt Bar feels about his swing and his his game and his approach on a day-to-day basis. And he said after the game today on, on the Bally Sports postgame show that Newt Bar's been feeling better in the recent days about his swing, and that certainly played out today with the homer off the bench. So that gives you a little bit more confidence maybe in Newt moving forward. All he already had that confidence is my point. When we were talking about maybe you send down Newt Bar, maybe you send down Gorman, I don't really think Newt Bar was ever a consideration, at least from Ollie, but he again, he doesn't make the decision. Mosellock does. Was Gorman a decision? Was that something that they ever considered to send down? Because, by the way, two lefties came off the bench today for pinch hit opportunities, Burleson and Newt Bar. You could have had Gorman come in, and it would have shifted Donovan to the outfield. He, he Gorman could have been either of those, but he wasn't. So that tells you the pecking order a little bit. I'm not even saying I disagree with it, but that's the pecking order, which then leads you to this other concept, and believe me, I am still going to play you the quote from John Mosellock because you have fresh in your mind what Ollie Marmel said about everything. Maybe not as fresh in your mind what Mo says because you haven't heard it. So how about this? Before I dive a little bit deeper on the Gorman part of this whole exchange, I'll play you the Mosellock part. You heard Ollie and everything he just said to the same question. Now it's going to be the same question from Tom Ackerman to Mosellock. Tell me if you hear the same answer. Tell me if you hear the synergy or not. Jordan Walker move up was interesting. You know, facing lefties was really the assignment there, wasn't it? That that was what I understood. Is it you wanted him to come up uh, because you had a need there? I talked to Ollie about that actually last hour. Yeah, I, I think a couple things. One, he was he was definitely swinging the bat well, and you know, in terms of of my philosophy, in terms of how you think about young players they really de- do need to be playing. So, you know, ultimately we just have to look at what what the schedule looks like, who we're facing, and map out a, a plan. And if we're not going to find every day at bats for them, then we may have to rethink that. So there you go. That's John Mosellock telling Tom Ackerman on KMOX Sports on a Sunday morning this Sunday, the 18th of August, 
that if there's not every day at bats to be had for Jordan Walker, maybe they'll have to rethink it at some point. It sounds like two completely different answers in a lot of ways. There's some similarities to the answers, of course. And then Moselak went on to say, you've got to be patient with Walker. We understand how young he is. That, I think, is a notion that flies in direct contrast with what Ollie Marmol's job is right now, which is to guide the Cardinals to the playoffs at all costs. There are competing interests happening here with what the Cardinal organization long-term needs from Jordan Walker versus what the Cardinal organization the next six weeks needs from Jordan Walker. And the field manager sees what they don't have on their roster and says, this guy can be that for us. I think Ollie Marmel, if you if you had the ability to provide him with a guy who does Jordan Walker's stats against lefties, but is a 28-year-old journeyman outfielder, quad A player, I think Ollie Marmel would say, I'd rather have that guy on the team because I understand that Jordan Walker isn't being fully utilized in the role that he's in, but this is what you gave me. If I'm Ollie Marmel, that's how I would feel about it. Because although Ollie Marmel could make the bold call to say, I'm going to sit Newt Barr and have Jordan Walker play over him against righties, Ollie Marmel sees that Newpar is coming around and is talking to him every day and recognizes what Lars Newpar can do when he takes walks and he hits for doubles and he hits for power when he's at his best. Ollie Marmel sees that Lars Newpar might be coming around toward his best. So I'm he's going to want to feed into that when the Cardinals are facing right-handed pitching. So you can't sit Lars Newpar against right-handed pitching. That's how the Cardinals manager sees it. And he's boots on the ground and we're not. Like, I'm, I'm just going to be in total fairness on this, right? So... You know that Victor Scott has to play center field because defensively, I, I think that's your best option. If you don't go that way, it's Newt Barr in center field. So one of the two is going to be in there anyway. Unless you put Pham in center, and I don't think they're as inclined to want to do that. And if that is what you're doing, you have to recognize, too, that Pham's going to be in center. Jordan Walker's going to be in right because this whole ploy is to get Walker into the lineup, right? So now you've got Walker flanking Pham to one side and Donovan to the other, which Donovan is a gold glove caliber Fielder. I have no problem with Brandon Donovan defensively, but is a Donovan fam Jordan Walker outfield defensively enough for the pitching staff that the Cardinals front office built? I don't know that it is. I don't necessarily know that it is. So you want to keep Victor in there if you can. And if you want that, it is damn near impossible to find a way to get Jordan Walker in against righties, which means he shouldn't be on the team. Quite frankly, he should not be on the team. They should have a capable version of whatever Moises Gomez was be on the team right now. But he wasn't capable, didn't perform this year, was probably fed up from the years that he did perform and he didn't get a call up. So demanded his release and they gave it to him. He had no good numbers this year. But like that is the player that this organization needs and doesn't have. I thought for a minute they were trying to let Jose Fermin be that. And then somehow in AAA, Jose Fermin is, you know, not really playing a lot of outfield, plays it occasionally, but wasn't really playing it enough, it seemed. And I don't know how you could call him up and tell Ollie Marmel, like, yeah, we trust Jose Fermin to play the outfield. We've seen it. It looks great. I don't really know if you can do that because he hasn't played it very much. It, it, like, remember, I remember the very B-shaped daily around, it feels like it was around the All-Star break, give or take, where we started seeing Jose Fermin in the outfield a little bit, and we were like, well, that's interesting. Go ahead and circle that because it was leading up to a period of time where we would potentially be seeing uh, trades made and guys like Dylan Carlson, hint, hint, not here because we told you that that trade was going to happen. By the way, Dylan Carlson had a walk-off hit today for the Rays. He is OPSing over 900 with the Rays and has hit three home runs since joining Tampa Bay. Yes, uh, an OPS above 900 is what I said. Remember that day, July 26, when I told y'all I would buy all of your Dylan Carlson stock at whatever cost you wanted to sell them for? Well, yeah, just I'm just saying. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. Anyway, uh, Jose Fermin was the shortstop in the Memphis lineup today. For a minute, it seemed like they were positioning him to potentially be this exact spot because they recognized that they didn't have at the big league level a very balanced bench. They didn't have the right-handed options, and you would almost need somebody that could play outfield for the reasons that we have described, even though it's kind of yucky. You're not gaining an extra right-handed bat unless it's an outfielder that's able to do that. And... Fermin has not been playing outfield exclusively. Like, if if the goal was to do that, 
from the very tippy top of your front office, you have to make sure that that's happening at the AAA level, if that's the goal. Otherwise, it's weird that they ever put him in the outfield to begin with, if it wasn't to try and position him for a potential slot like this. Now, granted, Jose Fermin, if you look at his numbers at the big league level, they Memphis this year has been great, hitting 311 and 926 OPS. Jose Fermin at the big league level has just not been able to put it together, but it's also come in sporadic opportunities. But even that could have potentially been the way you'd go. I mean, a 390 OPS with a 130 average and 51 plate appearances, like it's been so poor that if that's the guy that you would DFA for Thomas to JC, I honestly think that would have been the move. Now, I'm not trying to say you take Jose Fermin's job from him, but I'm just looking at the way the organization has used him. It hasn't made a lot of sense if if they were trying to add outfield to his bag of tricks. Why is he ever playing the infield in Memphis? Anyway, they had Luke and Baker down there, but we've talked about how that doesn't actually add a righty to the, the batting order for the very reasons. Like you heard, this is all stuff we've talked about, but it was good to hear Ollie Marmel for two minutes basically lay out the points and say, Pajes is going to catch against lefties. Contreras takes up the DH spot. So like a, a Luke and Baker doesn't fit in the starting lineup. The goal is to get a righty against a lefty in the starting lineup. You're not, you could say you should bench Goldie. Okay, say that all you want, but that's not accomplishing the goal of getting a righty instead of another lefty against lefties in that starting lineup. So Luke and Baker doesn't apply, right? Thomas Sejaci is someone that could have applied because you could you could play him at second base for, for Gorman and Donovan could play the outfield. So it doesn't have to be an outfielder. It had to be, the, the Jordan Walker spot had to be an outfielder unless it was Thomas Sejaci specifically. And not to spoil down on the farm, but he's the guy who homered today. The prospect that hit his 17th of the year. That was Sejaci. His numbers don't blow you away in the minors, but 17 homers, like that that's a pace to get, get close to 20, and he's got an OPS pushing 750. So that could have been the guy that has a little bit of versatility, flexibility for you, but they didn't obviously want to take the step to send down Nolan Gorman or to DFA Brandon Crawford. And then the Matt Carpenter IL comes and you go, oh, this could be a perfect spot. But I guess the 40 man is going to be the reason. And look, I don't play the game of telling you who to DFA. The only reason I said it regarding Fermin is because to me, it's just been very weird how he's been utilized. It was, was seemingly being positioned to play as, as that outfielder. And now maybe the it's over now, maybe, I don't know because it didn't happen. He was playing shortstop tonight. But, like, if your minor league manager is having to use guys that aren't in the best interest of the big league club just because they don't have enough guys at AAA that do the things they need to be doing, that's the organizational management that I am highlighting. So, once again, for people who have, have thought I was too easy on Ollie Marmel this year, and, and maybe you think I continue to be, I, there's a reason because I think I'm looking at a lot of the weird stuff that's happening, and I don't think it originates with Ollie Marmel. I think he's reacting to some of this stuff. He's not the one doing it. He's reacting to it. And so that's how you, like his explanation for the Jordan Walker thing, I believe it when I hear him say it. I, I don't like it because I do think that while his job is to maximize the everyday team this year and try to make the playoffs, the more important thing to the long term of the organization is, well, you can't use Jordan Walker that way. He's a 22-year-old top prospect. Like, don't 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 have this organization fumble the bag again on a young player. That's not good. But Ollie Marmel, like, he's got things he's got to do here or he's not going to be in the organization long term, right? Like, he knows that it's competitive to win at the big league level and that's his goal. So I, it's hard to blame him. Like I've said before, I'd like to think that he would have fallen into line to say, hey, let's put Jordan out there. But if you're sitting there going, I believe that Lars Newpar is going to give us the best chance. We just got to get him to that point again. And then he homers today. It's kind of hard to argue against it. So, like... For all the they should play Jordan Walker every day people, I'm with you. He has to play every day wherever he is. But what would your lineup be? I'm 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 not asking because I'm trying to attack the the people that are criticizing that move. I have criticized the move. But I'm curious, what would your lineup be to to make that happen, to facilitate that? Who how, who do you take out? If the answer is Gorman, folks, he's already out. I mean, he's and maybe it's it's Gorman against righties, but then that's another young player as well that you'd like to think. You don't just throw him in the trash and give up on him, but that's maybe where having him go to AAA and get everyday at bats could have been the best thing for the organization. But is it? Is it? And do they believe that it is? And then there's a 40 man issue if you're bringing up to JC anyway, um, because to me that would be the guy to now bring up if you were really going to be giving up on Gorman. But like, 
Gorman has had some moments more recently where he has played well, but it's come more sporadically. He play, he was one for four on Saturday. Prior to that, he went 0 for 3 on the 13th of August against the Reds. That was his only appearance in the Reds series. Against the Royals, I'd have to go all the way back to more than a week ago when I made the comment that he was doing better recently. That was my anecdotal thought on it, and then I looked up the numbers, and now I'm staring at them. He was 3 for 4 against the Royals and then 1 for 3 in the prior game against the Royals. He hasn't hardly played since then. It's been a week, and we've seen seven at-bats from Gorman. Gorman should be in AAA for Thomas Sejaci, period, the end. That's the way that they're going to get the most out of this situation, and it might be the way they get the most out of Nola Gorman as well. I, I think that is a move that has to happen today. It needs to happen on the off day Monday. Not because I'm a Nolan Gorman hater. There was somebody commenting that that it pained me last week to say good things about Nolan Gorman. That's ridiculous. I think the best version of the Cardinals has Nolan Gorman doing what he's capable of doing. But right now, the manager does not trust him to suddenly be doing that. And it might be the best thing for him to be able to get some consistent at-bats and just kind of recenter, hit that reset button. Now, how do you find a way to get Sejaci on the, the, the 40-man roster? I don't know, and clearly neither does John Mosellock, or it probably would have already happened. But to me, that's the move. If you are actually saying we have to win at all costs the rest of this season, that's the move because it doesn't seem to me as though Nolan Gorman is in a spot where he's going to be heavily utilized right now. When you have the preferred lefties off your bench as Burleson and Newpar. Not even saying I disagree with it, but that's the, the the hierarchy. That's the ranking. We just saw it play out on Sunday because those are who came off the bench and not Gorman. Gorman could have. He qualifies. When we say outfield, he qualifies because Donovan moves to second, which allows th that flexibility allows for Gorman to be in this category. But if he's third of three on that pecking order, I guess three of four if Brandon Crawford counts, but he doesn't. If he's third of three, then he's not going to be utilized in that role very frequently even when there was a lefty on the mound, so he's not the guy that comes off the bench. And then if that's the way we feel about it, and they're going to strain, as John Mozellick said, we'll have to look at the schedule and who we're facing. If they're going to strain to try and get Nolan Gorman into lineups along with Jordan Walker at some point against righties, then you're... I, I just don't think that there's a lot of utility to Gorman. The utility of Gorman is when you're playing him every day and he's he's hitting in the middle of your lineup and bashing homers. But I don't feel like that imminently is coming unless all he sees the same thing he saw with Newt Bar before his homer today of, hey, he's starting to take better at bats. We're going to see it come around. I don't get that sense that all he sees that from Gorman right now, just in the way that we're hearing the, the different players discussed. It's not that he said bad things about Nolan Gorman. All he would love nothing more, if I had to guess, than to see Nolan Gorman elevate his play to the level that he's been able to. Every time that he answers a question about Nolan Gorman, all he says He's just trying to get to the point where he can make consistent contact. It's just that is the line that he's used every time, and it's accurate. If that's where it is, I think JC gives the manager more utility. And so if from up top in the front office, they're trying to say, let's help this guy win more games because we feel like our jobs are on the line, then I think JC for Gorman would be the move, and you figure out the 40-man spot, for good for goodness sake. it's It's not – I'm not trying to be crass about it, but – in two months, in three months, two or three guys are going to be DFA'd off the 40-man anyway because they they didn't make sense on the roster. They weren't utilized. Most of couldn't figure out how to trade them, and so they'll go for nothing in November. It happens every every year, guys. So two or three guys from this team will be Patrick Wisdomed into oblivion sometime after the season ends. Why not just say, hey, this could actually help us win games right now. Let's not live in fear of our 40-man roster and, and be hamstrung by it and just say, you know what? Maybe Thomas and JC should be on this team if our goal is actually to try and win as many games as we can this year. And I think that is everybody's collective goal. I'm not questioning the front office that they don't want to win. I think they're just too afraid to do bold things to try and facilitate that. I think that has been one of the calling cards for Mo is he has just been stricken by indecision. And I, I feel like he knows also that his job is not in jeopardy. If anything, it is the opposite. I feel like Mosellock is going to be ready to, as he's said since February 2023, usher into something different. He's done this for a long time. He deserves the chance to do something different. But he's not general managing or poboing like his job is on the line. Because it isn't. And maybe that is the whole crux of the entire thing in the organization, that to turn this thing over, 
there just needs to be a little bit of a shift to where everybody is in a situation where doing their absolute best for both the short and long term is is what is expected. John Mozeliak has free reign to be able to manage as he sees fit, and I think that can lead to complacency at times, which I don't blame him. Like, if I'm John Mozeliak and I know that I'm never getting fired, why would I stress? Why would I overly stress about some of these things? Like, when you actually play through it, it makes perfect sense why the Cardinals are where they are. But I do think it is reaching a point where everybody's going to be able to feel it palpably that, okay, it's it's going to be somebody else's turn after 2024. And that could be regardless of whether the Cardinals make a great run or not. I think it might just be somebody else's turn. And it's not like Bill DeWitt's not bringing the hammer down. It, it, I think if that takes place, it's John Mozeliak stepping out with some dignity, saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into an advisory role or whatever it is from the last year of my contract, and we're going to start a transition period. So that, those are my thoughts. I, I know that this has ended up being more big picture, and I, I rambled on for longer than I intended to with a cold today, but that's where we're at. You guys let me know if I hit the nail on the head in the comments or tell me I'm an idiot in the comments. Either way, I appreciate your support and you guys for listening. I do think before I get out of here, though, since I did tease that we'd have it, we should have it. Let's go down on the farm. Mm -hmm. It's time to go down on the farm. Mm -hmm. Brought to you by Hastings Layers Premium Eggs. You'll be happier in a jackass eating thistle. Huh? So I mentioned Thomas Sejaci was the prospect that was alluded to who hit his 17th home run of the season for Memphis today. That is how it happened as he only went one for five but had two RBIs with the home run. He's hitting 249 in the season, OPSing 739. Doesn't blow you away, but I think the skill set is such that there might be utility to bringing him to the Cardinals roster. Um, I don't think it happens. Honestly, the, the Gorman thing, I don't I just don't know if the Cardinals are going to be willing to do it. You could make a case, though, that Sejaci up for Walker could even add the utility where Walker is able to do the things that he needs to do, which is play every day. And Sejaci would then... I get it that Sejaci is also a prospect, but it's not the same. Like, Sejaci could platoon, and I don't think that we're, we're hemming and hawing about his development, and we're really upset about that aspect of it. Maybe I'm wrong about that, though. But if you're going to do it with one or the other, I feel like Walker would be the guy you'd be a little bit more protective of in terms of the development, just personally. But so JC is only 22, so it's not like he's a, a different, you know, he's not 25 where he's done everything he's there is to do at AAA. It's not that situation. But anyway, so JC with a home run today. Memphis lost 10-9. to McGreevy got the start. He didn't give up the 10 runs, though. He only gave up two. Four and two-thirds, two runs allowed. So still solid for McGreevy. Uh, it was honestly guys you've heard of that have, that, that kind of got beat up for the bullpen. Granillo, Lutis, and Roycroft uh, all charged with multiple runs. Um, only one of them from Roycroft was earned, but he is charged with the blown save. Not good from Granillo, uh, unfortunately. Gave up three hits and a walk. All of those guys ended up scoring. Two home runs, did not record an out in his outing today. So that was a, a rough one and one to forget if you're Granillo. Two for five for Yvonne Herrera. Continuing to uh, swing a hot bat down there in AAA up to a 902 OPS. And again, the reason you can't bring him into the Walker spot and have the same level of utility is unless he can play corner outfield, there's just not really uh, a lot of benefit to that. He would be helpful off the bench, but I, I just don't know that that's the route that they were obviously looking to go with the Carpenter spot. They decided they wanted somebody who could actually start against lefties, and so that's how the, the Walker thing happened. We've talked enough about that, though. Uh, Mike Antico is another guy who hits left-handed, so he would not apply for the for the, the the role the Cardinals are needing, but he was leading off and went three for five in the game tonight with three RBIs, uh, also hit a home run. So good to see for him. The Springfield game is actually still ongoing as I record this. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish before they do, but they're tied 7-7 in the ninth. We can tell you about any of the offensive numbers from those guys. Chandler Redmond, two for four with a couple of RBIs. Uh, no home runs, though, hit in that game. Uh, Jimmy Crooks, we love Jimmy Crooks, on base three times. One for three, two walks, scored a run. He has a 922 OPS. That is a catcher who will be, he was DHing today, but that is a catcher who will be making his way up to AAA next year, you would have to imagine. Uh, But that is going to do it for this edition of the show. J.J. Weatherholt was 0 for 3 with a walk today, I believe was his numbers. I always like to kind of throw that in there at the end of Down on the Farm. But that'll do it for this edition of B-Shape Daily. Appreciate you guys, as always. Make sure you check out the Discord link in the description below and consider a channel membership if you're so inclined to support the channel in that way as well. That's going to do it for this one. Thank you, guys, and we'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace.